today uh, I wanted to finish up our, our discussion about writing and the ethics of writing and to start with where we left off um, on Tuesday, which is the Eisman case. Um, just briefly to recap, uh, as you'll remember, this is about the story about, uh, about McCain, it deals with many aspects of McCain's integrity, um, including the question of whether aides to McCain thought that he had an inappropriate relationship with a lobbyist, Vicki Eisman. Um, you all have read the complaint, and as we discussed uh, on Tuesday, she uh, argued that she was defamed by the story, that it hurt her reputation, um, that it implied a, an, unethical, an unethical relationship uh, with McCain, um, and implied that she had uh, used her relationship with him to advance the interests of her clients. Um, she sued the New York Times uh, for libel, um, and we'll talk about the legal standards for libel later, but uh, for the moment, let's just say that you know, she sued them for libel based on the notion that the story was false uh, and that it hurt her reputation, and she wanted $27 million, as, as I mentioned the other day. I don't know where that number comes from. Um, uh, well, Vicki Eisman did not get $27 million uh, from the New York Times. What she got is a series of statements, um, uh, a statement by the Times, a joint statement by the Times and her attorneys, uh, and then her attorneys were given the right to publish a piece. I think it only published on the web. Maybe it was on the, on the print, too. Uh, basically stating their view of the case, and the Times wrote a response to that. Um, the joint statement is, as you would expect, uh, very carefully uh, crafted, because it has to accommodate both her uh, view of what happened here and the Times' view. And basically, what it boils down to is that the Times uh, maintained throughout that it never said that she had a relationship with McCain, or that she never said that she had a romantic relationship with McCain, only that others said that she did. Um, and then so she, and then the joint statement deals with that issue by saying, to resolve the lawsuit, Ms. Eisman has accepted the Times' explanation, which will appear in a note to readers to be published in the newspaper of February 20th, blah, 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 that the article did not state and the Times did not intend to conclude that Ms. Eisman had engaged in a romantic affair uh, with Senator McCain. It goes on. Um, so note the carefulness of the language. To resolve the lawsuit, she has accepted, implying that she doesn't really fully accept it, but she's willing to say that in order to get this done with. Um, uh, and then, as I noted, the Times also agreed to publish a commentary uh, by her lawyers, uh, and, then to, and then they responded as well. Um, in their statement, um, her lawyers, uh, obviously, were not bound by the, by the strictures of this joint statement, so they were able to go much further in defense of her. Um, uh, they quote from the suit saying what it alleged. Um, they describe the criticism that came to the Times afterward as an avalanche of criticism from readers, public commentators, and even the New York Times' public editor. Um, and then they reach uh, what, what to me is the, the sort of crux of the matter and the thing that worth discussing a little further here today, which is the question of, is Vicki Eisman properly thought of as a public figure? Um, and we talked about this a little bit uh, in class the other day. Here is what her lawyers have to say about that issue. The essential quality of our public discourse, even the very character of our national culture, will be heavily influenced by why, where, and how we draw this line, meaning the line between public and private figures. The rules of engagement ought not to be the same for public figures and private persons. To disregard this important distinction or to draw the line of demarcation in the wrong place will degrade our political discourse and diminish both the dignity of individuals whose private lives are reported upon as well as the dignity of the journalists and news organizations who report upon them. It does not lessen the harm done in the life of a private individual merely because that harm is viewed as collateral damage in an article whose focus is a public official. That's a pretty uh, smart statement, I think, on the, on in defense of the notion of the privacy of certain people. Um, in response, uh, the New York Times statement um, r r r you know, com comes back at that by saying, we are confident that if they had been tested in court, the plaintiff's arguments would have failed on their merits. In particular, we do not share the plaintiff's attorney's views that their client is, quote, not even a public figure, end quote. A publicly registered lobbyist is hired to influence public officials on matters of public policy. You'll note that that sentence includes the word public three times. That's probably not an accident. Um, that seems to us exactly the sort of figure journalists are supposed to watch with close attention and who thus are required to meet a higher standard in proving defamation. That, I would also argue, is a very intelligent statement on the other side of this. So before I start to uh, sort of unwrap this a little bit, let me ask all of you. You've read the complaint. You've read the story. Uh, who here thinks that she's a private figure? Or, or conversely, who thinks she's a public figure? What, what, what do you all think about whether she's a private or public figure? Yeah. I think at least she's a limited purpose public 
Mm. Because if not only from all of, like her relationship with McCain kind of thrust her into the limelight. Mm -hmm. so, and, I, and I believe by law that makes her prove actual knowledge. Uh, that you're right on all points. Uh, the, I had not introduced the idea of a limited purpose public figure, but uh, you're right. Um, there is a third category here of people who might not be considered public figures for all purposes. Um, if you're you know, writing a story about uh, uh, you know, the baseball season, you might not consider Vicki Eisman a relevant public figure for that story, but that she might be in this particular instance but based solely on her relationship with McCain. Uh, so that's a third option here. Um, anybody else? I'm sorry, tell me your name again. Kyle. Tile. Or Kyle, rather. I, think. I, I would agree with that, too, because when, when you're a lobbyist, you, you take a position of leadership that you're going to represent whatever interest you're serving, and then you're going to be that person who's interacting with the politicians who are certainly public figures. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's no question here. John McCain is a public right. figure. Uh, he's a consummate public He's run for president, for God's sake. Uh, yeah, so, so he's sort of out of bounds so on this conversation. With but. the limited purpose, isn't it that... Um, you only have to prove actual malice if the issue, if like what the what you're being accused of has to do with the reason why you're famous. The yeah, we'll discuss and, and certainly when lawyers come in uh, later, uh, Kelly and Carlene talk to you later in the course. We'll talk more specifically about precisely what these standards are. But for the moment, let's just say that yes, it requires there is a higher burden of proof on a public figure to win a lawsuit, a libel suit against a news organization than there is on a private figure. Private figures are, um, uh, are enjoy greater constitutional protection against false stories uh, than public figures do. So that would have been, it certainly would have been a major debate in this case, because as you can see from the two statements, they would have argued quite ferociously on the question of which standard applied to her. And so that's all we're really sort of boiling down to today, is which, which <coughs> do you think ought to have applied to her? Yes. Um, kind of bouncing off of them, like, I definitely don't think she's a public figure because she's not really a household name. Like, people on the street don't really know her besides what's in this story. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say she's a private figure either because obviously this story it conjured up a lot of talk and things like that. So as far as a limited purpose public figure goes, I would say that she had to prove actual malice just because what she's being, what she's suing about is what made her a public figure. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I'd be curious to know if, and I don't know if you do, mm -hmm. um, she did like press statements and things before she did this whole story. I don't know, but my guess is no. Uh, my guess is that she was not public in that sense and that she was inviting publicity. Um, uh, I, I think I'm correct about that. <clears throat> Anybody else? Um, all right, well, let me uh, then, and I think those are all uh, smart ways of sort of coming at this problem. To back up a little, and again, not to go too deeply into the legal issues here, um, which we'll do later, uh, but basically this law, uh, this notion of different sort of status of, of public figures and the, in the uh, <laughs> constitutional uh, 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 provisions that apply to them or the constitutional protections that apply to them grows out of the, the first and most important case uh, in this uh, area is New York Times versus Sullivan. And you'll read that in a couple of weeks. Um, New York Times versus Sullivan, which was decided in 64, I think it was, um, holds that a public official, uh, in that case, um, I believe he was the police commissioner or sheriff uh, of uh, Birmingham or Montgomery, I think it was Montgomery, uh, Alabama, um, who was suing over errors in an ad, that he had to show that the, the errors in the ad uh, were done with intentional malice or recklessness with respect to him. Um, so it, it, the New York Times versus Sullivan um, establishes the public figure standard, then applies it uh, to the, the plaintiff in that case and rules against him. Now, Again, I don't want to go too far into the case law, but one of the things that complicates New York Times versus Sullivan in terms of a First Amendment case is it's also a civil rights case. Um, the, the ad that was taken out against him was by civil rights organizations. Um, the errors in the ad are relatively trivial. Uh, at one point it says that uh, police officers ringed uh, a building when in fact they just formed a line in front of a building. And so while they weren't errors that went to the point of the ad, there were mistakes in the ad. And so what the court holds in that case is that innocent mistakes, not intended with malice, are not enough to sustain a libel claim. And then the court does a very unusual thing in that case, which is that rather than establish a standard and then send it back to a, a lower court to decide the matter, having, having articulated the rule, it just decided it itself. And that has a lot to do with the civil rights context in the case. The, the court, 
beginning with Brown versus Board of Education, which is the school desegregation case, obviously, and continuing out throughout the 50s and 60s, really acted in a kind of protective role to protect the civil rights movement uh, and to try to allow that protest uh, to go forward. If they had sent this case back to the Alabama courts, the Supreme Court knew full well what would happen, which is the Alabama courts would then take the new standard and decide again uh, on behalf of the plaintiff. And the court wanted to save the civil rights movement that struggle when it knew ultimately it was going to decide it the way it did. Um, so that, but that case, uh, importantly, only established this, this was a public official. This was a government official who was the plaintiff in that case. Later on, and I'm forgetting exactly how far later, but a few years later, the court had to address a different question, which is that what about people who are in the public eye but who are not public officials? Um, and one of the cases in this involved a football coach, a college football coach. College football coach is not a public official, but is a well-known person in the community often. Um, and the court had to decide the question of, is, does the language that they have written, had written in Sullivan about public official apply to people who don't hold a government office? And it found that it does, or that it can. Um, so to sort of cut through all that, and back to Vicki Eisman, um, is she you know, more like a private person, more like a college football coach, or more like a public official, a public figure? And I guess, um, you know, and I, I, uh, this is, as I stressed at the outset, this is the subject of a robust debate, so there is no right answer to this. I guess my tendency would be to argue more closely to the New York Times position uh, in their statement than to Eisman's lawyers. Um, it does seem to me that um, even if she hadn't had a relationship with McCain, that the act of lobbying is so close to the act of governing that if, if, the, if the press should, uh, should have wide leeway to report um, on public <coughs> officials, that it necessarily needs the same leeway to, uh, to report on those who lobby those public officials. So I would have argued, uh, and certainly the New York Times would have argued, that even if she didn't have a relationship with McCain, that, sh that the work that she's involved in is public work and that she therefore deserve, that the Times therefore deserves the protections of reporting on a public official when they report on her. Um, there is a problem, though, that the New York Times may, might have created for itself in this case, which is that, remember, these allegations, the, the, the behavior that's under scrutiny here is 10 years old, uh, almost 10 years old when the Times story appears. It goes back to 99 and their story came out in 2008. Um, at no point in those 10 years did they ever report on her and her lobbying, as far as I'm aware, certainly not in, in connection with this uh, instance. So one of her arguments almost certainly would have been, um, if I was such a public figure, why didn't you name me ever before? Why am I suddenly now a public figure, now that there's this suggestion of a relationship with McCain? That then might have gotten back to your point that maybe she ends up in a kind of uh, a, um, a limited public figure category. Um, in either instance, I think that the, the plaintiff's lawyers would have had a hard time uh, showing that she was a purely private figure and entitled to all those protections. Now, that said, they might have won anyway. I mean, you know, if they, this had gone to, certainly it's their view that if they had taken this the whole way, they would have won. But both sides, ultimately, you know, one of the things that, um, that distinguishes many lawsuits against news organizations, they tend to involve big dollar amounts, um, but in, in the end, what the plaintiffs are often looking for is a measure of vindication, not, not usually a big sum of money. Um, now, sometimes there are big sums of money that change hands. In this case, it feels like she got basically what she wanted, which is this times to say publicly, we never meant to say that we, th that we proved that she had an affair with McCain. Um, she got that, the whole thing went away. But what it left hanging is this still unresolved question that comes up all the time of a, a public versus a private figure. And, and her case, I think, really tests that. And in, in some ways, for the sake of the law, if not for the sake of the Times or for Vicki Eisman, it would have been interesting to see this case go forward because it really would have explored uh, that question. As it is, we're left to just sort of debate it. Um, okay, so uh, that sort of concludes uh, our trip down Vicki Eisman lane. Um, uh, let me talk a little bit about errors. Um, uh, everyone, okay, start with uh, the obvious fact that everyone makes uh, mistakes and that newspapers are, and news organizations are made up of lots of people all of whom were capable uh, of making mistakes. Um, you know, that said, if you read newspapers carefully and often, you'll find a lot of errors in them. Uh, certainly, if you ever find yourself written about, um, you will become acutely conscious of the fact that there are often mistakes made uh, in pieces um, in, in uh, news coverage. So I, the, the sort of first question I would ask is why? I mean, you know, other than just sort of simple error, why are there so many mistakes uh, that we can find in news coverage? And I would offer a couple of uh, thoughts on that. First of all, um, 
one of the changing dynamics, at least changing over the course of my career uh, in, in newspaper coverage or in journalism, is that we have, we, many, many more people have access to coverage today uh, than used to. Um, it used to be, frankly, that if you were a foreign correspondent um, or even a national correspondent in a remote part of the country, you, it was relatively rare um, that the people you'd be writing about would follow your coverage closely because you would report it in one place, send it off to another place, and it would publish in, you know, in Atlanta or Des Moines or Pittsburgh or wherever it would, but the people that you were writing about in Phoenix or, or you know, Seattle or wherever wouldn't see it. And that's especially true uh, in foreign cultures where people, you know, foreign correspondents would file stuff back and the people they were writing on often didn't speak English, um, were very far away, did not have ready access uh, to the newspaper that, that, um, that ran the story. Um, so I, one, one thing that is clearly happening now is that more people who know things about the facts and stories are reading them. And they're calling them on. It's also much easier to register a complaint uh, than it used to be. It's just click away. Um, so we hear much more, we in newspapers, hear much more about, uh, about coverage that people dispute. Now, it's not always wrong, but that people uh, dispute it. The other thing, and this has been true uh, uh, throughout modern journalism, is that journalists are supremely accountable uh, for their work. The byline you know, attaches a reporter's name to the story, and the reporter is responsible for everything in that story. Um, you know, that, as I say, that has always been uh, the case. Uh, and it, 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 in contrast to many uh, professions where, you know, for instance, there's a big dispute today in law enforcement about police officers who engage in shootings. Should, there, should a police officer who's been involved in a shooting have his or her name be released to the public? Um, it has been our contention at the newspaper, and certainly my contention on the editorial pages, that it should, that the police officers are engaged in public work and that their conduct while performing public work ought to be a matter of public record. Well, the police unions, uh, with some support from uh, government officials, uh, have decided, have persuaded the government to stop releasing those names in a lot of cases. So police officers are engaging in a kind of public work with a certain degree of anonymity. Um, that is not true of most reporters. Most reporters are writing and publishing their names on the pieces that they write. So when they make a mistake, not only is that mistake more obvious to more people than it used to be, but the person who made the mistake is also easily found. Uh, so reporters uh, hear more about mistakes than they used to. Um, okay, so that talks. So those are both points as to why mistakes may be getting caught more often or brought to the attention of reporters more often. But why are they being made uh, at all? Um, and I, I'm certainly open to any of your thoughts on all of this. I'll just offer a few. Um, I do think that we live uh, in a culture in which hyperbole uh, and exaggeration um, are very commonplace. Um, whether it's the culture of, of uh, Hollywood, you know, entertainment coverage that is very gushy and overwrought and, you know, everyone is the biggest star or the, the biggest celebrity or, um, I mean, I think that leads itself to a certain amount of, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it builds on a certain kind of exaggeration and hyperbole um, that, that make people careless with what they're saying. Um, you know, we, you'll often see an event uh, described, something described as unprecedented. Very few things in life are actually unprecedented. I've, I have made it a, a mission to try to eliminate the use of the word unprecedented uh, in the pages of the LA Times because there are very few things for which there is not some precedent. People use the word unprecedented to mean unusual. Um, well, words mean things. And I think as we get accustomed to speaking uh, in sort of grandiose or exaggerated terms, we tend to misuse words and then we tend to make mistakes. Um, you know, every battle uh, in Washington these days, the healthcare battle, it's unprecedented. Well, no, no, in fact, it's not. Um, there have been battles about healthcare since Dwight Eisenhower uh, was president, actually, probably before that even. Uh, yeah, in fact, it's at least since Truman. Um, so there's a sense that the times that we are living in are sort of special, uh, and that, that leads, I think, to a certain kind of exaggeration. There's also, we also live in a culture where people are openly uh, and uh, you know, ferociously opinionated uh, in a way that was is more true today than has been. Uh, and we also live, frankly, in a culture where people uh, are qu feel quite free to lie. Um, you know, I mean, we've just been through a debate, just to go back to the health care issue for a moment, we went through this, you know, sort of silly uh, debate over the summer about whether the health care bill provided for death panels. It does not. Um, that didn't stop people from saying that it did. Um, people who otherwise are taken seriously um, made the allegation, and the, the reporting on it sort of treated it as, well, some people say that, it does, that the bill does include death panels, and some people say that it doesn't. Well, you can read the bill. 
uh, I mean, there's no reason to, to set that up as a debate. There's, a, there's truth and there's lying about it. And I think one problem, that particularly in a very fast-paced journalistic culture right now, is that it's much easier to just go quote people who disagree than to actually go and figure out what the truth is. Um, does the, does the uh, health care bill provide for insurance for illegal immigrants, for instance? This is something that was so hotly debated that if you'll recall when, when Obama was uh, delivering uh, his State of the Union address that a member of Congress stood up and said, you lie. Um, well, no, he didn't. Um, the fact is that the bill does not provide for health insurance for illegal immigrants, neither the House bill nor the Senate bill. It didn't when he was uh, giving the speech either. So that was reported as Obama says one thing, member of Congress, uh, you know, insultingly interrupts the speech and says another. Well, that's true that both of those things happen, but there's also an underlying truth to it. And reporting out people who disagree is not as satisfying as actually getting to the bottom of it. And, and in fact, it, it means that you're reporting things that often are false. And that leads, I think, to a sort of prevalence of errors and pieces. Um, now, again, I don't want to suggest that uh, public officials or, you know, lying is a brand new thing. I mean, I, I happen to be working on a book on, on Eisenhower and, the, and, you know, the Joe McCarthy period uh, is in the early part of the Eisenhower administration. It's a horrific period in terms of uh, sort of public discourse and journalistic coverage of it. So these things are not brand new, but I think that, they, the, you know, the, both the Internet and the kind of 24-hour news uh, cycle are such that it tends to spread them faster. Mistakes get made more, more quickly. And sometimes they get fixed more quickly, uh, but I think that haste uh, often contributes to these too. Uh, there are other issues, and some of these are in the text, um, that, that do contribute, I think, uh, to errors. And a really big one um, that uh, certainly I have seen over the years is the loss of expertise um, in certain kinds of reporting. Um, just to give you a few examples uh, that I know of, you know, when, when uh, Dick Reardon uh, was the mayor of L.A., um, elected in 2000, or 1993, I think it was, uh, it, when he was elected, the people at the L.A. Times who covered his early administration, a guy named <coughs> Clifford, uh, Bill Boyarsky, they, they knew far more about city government than Dick Reardon did, um, which isn't to say that he didn't have good ideas or different, you know, brought new things to it, but he was relatively new. He'd never run for office before. Um, he'd been a a Rec and Parks Commissioner and had some involvement in city affairs. He's quite, as a philanthropist, also very involved. Um, but the people who were covering him knew stuff about how the city worked and who was who in it. Um, when I uh, covered the LAPD, uh, Chief Williams uh, was uh, named a chief in 92, I think it was. Um, I, you know, I covered the LAPD before Williams uh, was chief, and I covered it after he was gone. I spent much more time at the LAPD than Chief Williams did. Um, so I knew things, uh, and it made it easier to cover it in a thoughtful way. Some of the people I worked with uh, at the time, Ron Ostrow is a name that some of you may recognize. Uh, Ron w covered the Justice Department. When I came to the LA Times, I mean, Ron had covered uh, the Justice, he covered Watergate, uh, so in 74. When I came to the paper, he was still covering uh, the Justice Department. Again, I don't even know how many attorneys general had come and gone during that period, or how many presidents even, if you think about it. Uh, Ron knew more people and more stuff about the Justice Department than many, if not most, people who worked there. Uh, that's true down the line. Henry Weinstein used to cover legal affairs for us. Tim Rutten uh, was a, a local government editor. Um, Linda Greenhouse, who we talked about earlier uh, in this class. Linda Greenhouse spent more time covering the court than some justices uh, who she covered. In fact, a lot of them come to think of it. Um, so, you know, that, that doesn't mean that these people are perfect by virtue of their experience or that they don't get a name wrong or spell something, to, but they knew things. Um, they knew, uh, you know, they knew sort of who, who knew what, uh, which is an important part of journalism, of who, knowing who to ask something. Um, and today, uh, candidly, there is less of that uh, in most newsrooms, uh, certainly at the LA Times, um, than there was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Um, some of that has to do with the business of journalism, and I, I'll devote uh, a session uh, later on in the course to the, the sort of ethics of the business of journalism. Um, but, you know, it's a smaller staff, it's a younger staff, um, and in some cases I think that that does lead uh, to more errors uh, than we used to have. Um, then there's just, frankly, carelessness. Um, and, you know, any, uh, any, I, I didn't bring the paper with me today, but I know our editor, Shelby Coffey, used to say that a Sunday Los Angeles Times had more words in it than the New Testament. Um, well, that's a lot of words, and some of them are bound to be wrong. Um, and so, you know, when you publish uh, that frequently and at that volume, there are mistakes that creep in. I, I asked the library uh, yesterday just to check my own uh, record. You know, over the course of, of my career at the paper, according to the library, I've had 2,255 uh, byline stories in the paper. 
um, you know, almost a thousand of which appeared on the front page of the paper, uh, and I've had 22 corrections. Um, uh, well, that's by my count about one per hundred stories, and I have to say, reading them kind of made, made me sort of nauseous to go back over all the corrections. Um, but, you know, for the most part, uh, I'm happy to report uh, that they tend to be small errors. I've misspelled the band, the Midnighters, uh, is misspelled in a piece. I refer to anthrax and ricin as chemicals in a piece, where ricin is a toxic protein and anthrax is a disease. Um, uh, I described a guy who was, uh, I described one uh, source as the president of the African American Chamber of Commerce, when in fact he was a member of the African American Chamber of Commerce and didn't speak for the organization. So, you know, there, I've made mistakes, uh, and, and everyone uh, does. And I guess my point is just that, that when you magnify that over the course of an entire staff uh, and over the course of an entire newspaper and then over a long period of time, you find a lot of errors. Um, as I say, most of those are innocent errors, um, and the solution to them uh, is a forthright correction. Um, uh, one of the things that has that is extremely difficult, uh, and, uh, and we can talk more about corrections in a minute, but, you know, like anyone, journalists are defensive about being accused of getting something wrong. Um, it, for those of you who go on to a career in journalism, let me just say that uh, your obligation to fix something that's wrong is exactly as uh, serious as your obligation to get something right in the first place. You'll get some things wrong. Um, but the answer to that is not to ask for someone not to say anything. It's not to fight a correction. Um, it's not to uh, you know, resist reporting the truth. Part of reporting the truth is reporting when something is wrong and fixing it. Um, it's, if, you, if you do it with a, sort of a good, good faith and with a, with a clean conscience, uh, you can resolve a lot of problems quickly that otherwise grow into um, you know, lawsuits and, and whatnot that, that you know, sort of become an overwhelming problem instead of a small one. Um, and then there is another kind of mistake. Uh, and before uh, talking about it in depth, let me just read you uh, the top of a piece that appeared in the Washington Post uh, some years ago. Uh, it begins, Jimmy is eight years old and a third generation heroin addict. A precocious little boy with sandy hair, velvety brown eyes, and needle marks freckling the baby smooth skin of his thin brown arms. He nestles in a large beige reclining chair in the living room of his comfortably furnished home in southeast Washington. There is an almost cherubic expression on his small round face as he talks about life, clothes, money, the Baltimore or Orioles, and heroin. He has been an addict since the age of five. His hands are clasped behind his head, fancy running shoes adorn his feet, and a striped Izod t-shirt hangs over his thin frame. Bad, ain't it, he boasts to a reporter visiting recently. I got me six of these. Jimmy's is a world of hard drugs, fast money, and the good life he believes both can bring. Every day, junkies casually buy heroin from Ron, his mother's live-in lover, in the dining room of Jimmy's home. They cook it in the kitchen and fire up in the bedrooms. And every day, Ron or somebody else fires, or someone else fires up Jimmy, plunging a needle into his bony arm, sending the fourth grader into a hypnotic knot. That is some powerful writing. It is also false, um, every word of it. Um, this was written by Janet Cook, uh, who was a reporter at the Washington Post. Again, I'm forgetting the exact date. I think this was in the early 80s or late 70s. Um, <clears throat> uh, this uh, piece uh, created a huge stir uh, in Washington. It won a Pulitzer Prize, um, and it's made up. Um, the Post, it's, it was the first example of a sort of giant journalistic deception, at least that I was aware of uh, in, in my career. I'm sure there were many earlier, but uh, it's, it, it created a giant uh, stir at the time. It was a huge uh, problem within the Washington Post. The Post gave back the Pulitzer Prize. Um, uh, there was, I, I've even heard uh, over the years, I think people have written about this, that when, <laughs> when questions began to be raised by it, because you know, people wanted to help this kid. I mean, this, is, this would be a kid in grave danger, obviously. Um, and so the piece ran, and the mayor wanted to help him, and other people wanted to help him, and that Post was very sort of hinky about who he was, and then I, what I've always heard is that one day Ben Bradley, who was then the editor of the Post, uh, said to Janet Cook, all right, let's get in the car, you show me where he lives. Um, and then in the course of that ride, she confessed um, that she'd made him up. Um, now, I gotta tell you, I do not know why people do this. Uh, I, you, know, you know, there are other instances of it, and I'll talk about one that I was involved in in a minute here, but you, of course, uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Jason Blair uh, at the New York Times, very talented uh, writer who uh, fabricated a whole bunch of stuff. Um, we'll read uh, later in the course a uh, description of, the, of an episode involving a reporter at USA Today uh, named Jack Kelly. Um, again, a celebrated reporter uh, for USA Today who turned out to have fabricated a whole bunch of stuff. Um, 
I, I don't, uh, I, I wish I understood better why someone would go into a business whose you know, fundamental edict is to tell the truth and then decide not to. I mean, there's something obviously sort of fundamental and deceptive uh, about some of these uh, personalities. Um, what, what I would point out, though, is that journalism is really uh, susceptible uh, to this kind of liar. Um, it's very hard for an editor to know, just looking at a piece. It's, it's not terribly hard to know if there are little problems in a piece. You can look at if there are anonymous sources that are used improperly, if there are things that are unclear or uh, you know, details that need to be uh, sort of fleshed out, if the story is told in the wrong order, if the news is in the bottom. You know, there's lots of things you can look for to make better in a piece. But it's very hard to look at a piece and know if somebody has just bullshitted the entire thing. Uh, because that, this story, I mean, you know, I, don't, I have no idea who edited uh, the, the J Janet Cook pieces, but that's beautiful writing. That's beautifully told. If I were an editor, I'd have a very hard time um, making that better. Um, but what I, when I asked, if I asked her where did this all come from and she lied about it, I don't have a lot of ability to check that. Now, there are things, and I think all news organizations that have been through a, a problem case like one of these, um, have learned from them. There are things you can ask. I mean, he, her editor could have said, you know, can I meet Jim? Um, can I, you know, can, can you tell me more about where he lives? Tell me something so that, you know, if people want to give to him that we can do something to help them. You know, there are questions that might have fleshed this out early. Um, but in general, if she were willing to lie about those things, it's, it's hard to catch. Uh, and so one of the things that I guess I'd love for you all to leave uh, this course with is the sense of responsibility that that uh, necessarily places on a working journalist. That not only is there an obligation to tell the truth to readers, which is of course the sort of preeminent obligation, but there's an, there's an obligation to be truthful. To be truthful in your reporting, to be truthful in your relationships with editors. Yeah, sure. Uh, it obviously isn't as malicious. I know you, I know you say you close the book on ice, but the editors fight that story like three or four times right before it where they ran it over a course of a long period of time. They debated it for a long time, right. right. And they, it, you know, it started out with extramarital affair and, and this and that, and they just kept watering it down, watering it down, because they didn't have the, the hard evidence. So they know that when that story hits the public, uh, and the readership and, and, the, and the pundits, especially as politics became being in racing, are going to say, you know, look, look at this big scandal. And not until those who close read it and see that it was a, you know, someone told him, don't meet with her, you know, like you explained. Right. Isn't that, isn't that equally as unethical? Or is that the, I know it's not quite as malicious as this situation, right. but it's still it. Well, often the process of editing is winnowing down the, to the material that you have to what you can say with confidence, you know, so that you don't want to overstate in pieces. But you're, so, and in that sense, there's nothing unusual about the editing of the item piece, that reporters come back, they say, we've got this, this, and this, and the editor says, well, let me ask you about this piece of it. You know, can we really say, do we really know that? And that's when a reporter will often say, well, I know that a source told me that, and they'll say, well, how many sources, and do they have independent knowledge? And that kind of conversation sometimes results not in spiking the story altogether, but in toning it back to, to what you feel like you can say with confidence. But you're absolutely right that it's important in the course of that conversation to listen to what's happening, not just to sort of winnow back to the, the maximum thing you can say and not be successfully sued for libel. You need to really be asking the question, uh, do we know it? Uh, is it true? Um, now, as you, as, as you point out, I don't think there's anything intentionally deceptive about the New York Times' coverage of the Eisen case. They were, they were struggling to say as much as they could responsibly, and maybe they went too far, maybe they didn't. It really depends on, on your perspective on it. When you make up a kid and describe him as a heroin addict, you're in a whole new realm. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, there's no def there. There's plenty of ways to defend what the New York Times was doing in the Vicky Eisenman case. There is no way to defend this. Um, yes. I've just that story alone just being so manufactured in that. I mean, it's. I, if I were the editor, I would have not run that story, let that story run unless I checked it, like really checked it. I mean, that just seems like something way too. Well, you can be sure they wish they'd done that in retrospect. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know much about uh, her career, so I can't tell you what kind of regard she was held in. Now, I, I think I mentioned to you uh, early in this class there was a Barry Burak piece that led about heroin addiction. In fact, that led with the uh, uh, Lee that I will never forget that said, "You know, heroin is his shepherd; he shall always want." And it was a description of heroin use. Now, it didn't invent a kid. Um, but, uh, you know, and it was, and I certainly don't mean to buy anything wrong with Barry. It was a beautiful piece uh, and responsibly written in every way. Um, 
But there's a lot of vivid stuff out there happening in the world, and some of it makes its way into newspapers. And some of it, uh, by necessity, requires not telling every. Now, let's, let's imagine for a moment that Jimmy were a real person. Probably would be an argument within the newsroom of, should we use his real name? Should we use his full name? Because do we really want to, and we'll talk about identification next week, but do we really want this person to permanently be known as someone who was an eight-year-old drug addict? Um, so probably, even if he'd been real, I suspect it would have been written sort of like this, in the sense that they probably would have kept his last name out of it. They probably would have tried to protect him in certain ways. Uh, but you're, again, your underlying point, I think, is a really sound one, which is that something that is so shocking as this ought to cause a conversation about uh, how is this happening? How would you find this person? I mean, there are questions that could have been asked that might have fleshed it out. How would you find him? You know, has he given permission for his name to be used? What's his mom say about him being featured in this? His mom, by the way, although not named, is identified as a dealer uh, in this piece, so she might have an interest in this. I mean, so there's a lot of questions. I don't know whether they were asked and, and then th she lied in response or whether they weren't asked, but you're right, they might have caught this and kept this from happening. Let me go to the back first, yes. Um, when, you, when you were reading that, it sounded more like a narrative story to me mm -hmm. than a report, and like there was a lot of detail in there about his clothes and things like that that just didn't sound very believable to me that she would actually like report. It sounded like something that you would just kind of get off the top of your head, mm -hmm. which she obviously did, but um, it didn't seem like, I, I feel like if I was reporting with someone, like I wouldn't be like, Writing down exactly what they were wearing, or well, uh, I understand your what your uh, point is. Although I would say, great reporters get those kinds of details. So um, it is uh, it's plausible to me that a reporter who spent a lot of time writing on addiction or writing on heroin or uh, writing on uh, poverty would the best ways to tell those stories are by putting together exactly those kinds of details. Now, the all the more important that the details be true. Um, but I wouldn't, that fact alone wouldn't cause me to think that there was something amiss here. Um, it would be how she answered the other questions that might, that might make me focus on it. Yes? Um, I actually, <coughs> I actually thought the story was um, pretty believable. Like when you read it, I, I, mm -hmm. I, it, I thought it was true. Which makes me wonder, like after, after that happened, are there now um, rules that maybe some editors have stuff that maybe like require like a list of contacts with every, you know, story that they figure out, like a full name, email, contact number, or something? Uh, I don't know of any formal set of rules. Some papers may have those and some may not. Uh, I'm not aware of a set of rules quite like that at the Los Angeles Times, for instance. Um, but I think that uh, because there have been a number of these instances of deception uh, over the last, you know, couple decades, uh, I think many editors will ask more questions about a piece. Um, that is full of this kind of detail. You know, it, and as I say, there might have been things, might have been questions to ask. You know, what is that, what's the address? What's their phone number? Do you mind if I talk to the mom? If I'm the editor now, imagining a conversation with a reporter, you know, I might ask, could I speak to the mom about this? Uh, could I meet Jimmy? Um, you, you won't do that on every story, but this was clearly a special piece of writing, and it might have warranted that kind of inquiry, and it might have stopped it. Um, now, I, I'm not gonna go in great detail about the Jason Blair case, uh, but, in Blair's case, uh, just to sort of give you a short version, um, there were other instances in which editors were really suspicious of him. Some editors were, some weren't. Um, there were uh, allegations of substance abuse, blah, blah, blah. So the New York Times um, did try to really monitor him. In fact, someone I know was, was assigned to monitor him for a while. And for that period, he apparently did quite well. So, um, you know. Uh, it's as my point though with both of these I guess would be is you can't watch these people all the time and you can't know for sure what they're reporting you can just ask questions that might keep something out of the paper if they're trying to bullshit you um, yes um, when it comes to running the correction uh -huh. for example like the eyes and when they had to run the correction on that um, they by the way they do not describe that as a correction uh, they describe that as a note to readers but right. <laughs> um, I mean that was a front page story mm -hmm. so my question is where did that where does Mm-hmm. Well, right. The, there is a uh, principle, I think, in the law um, that a correction should run in substantially the same position uh, as the, where the error was made. Now, what I think we've interpreted that, or we've sort of, you know, uh, our application of that principle has been to always run corrections in the same place. Um, so, meaning that 
you don't put a, you don't move the correction around the paper depending on where it appeared. Sometimes stories appear at different places in different editions. Of course, on the web is a whole different thing. Um, the idea, I think, of a of a dedicated place for corrections is so that people can turn that people who are looking for what the mistakes were can find them easily. Now, there are some stories. Yeah, I know what you're about to ask. Yes, uh, there are some stories that are such a big deal that they are corrected differently. Um, I was uh, when I worked on the Foreign Desk at the New York Times. There was a piece on the Iran. Uh, contra proceedings that had an error in it that had run on the front page and they ran a story the next day that corrected the error in that story with a separate story also on the front page. That's rare and is done, I think, when there's a recognition that perhaps the story, it, by making the error, the story has then affected other people. So people are now assuming the error to be true and are acting on it. So you want to really sort of stop everything and get it right. Um, there are also some other, and I'll talk a little bit about cor more about corrections in a minute, but um, there are also other parts of the paper that treat uh, corrections differently. On the, ed on the editorial pages, for instance, um, we run all our corrections on the editorial pages. We try to correct op-ed pieces on the op-ed page and editorials on the editorial page. In that sense, we probably are the purest form of correcting things in substantially the same position, but it, it, that's mainly because we report to a different, we report directly to the publisher, not to the editor of the paper, and so we kind of have to handle them in-house anyway. Um, that's also true. Calendar, I think, runs some of its own corrections. Um, it does. Uh, business, I think, does the same. So there's an effort to meet that standard. Yes? Well, I'm not supporting any of these reporters for like, I'm just trying to think why they're doing this kind of thing. And the only thing I can imagine is with the economy you have is with the onset of television and the internet that maybe there's a lot of cuts on the newsroom with positions and they think that they have to write better to keep their job. Is that I think that's some of it, although I would point out that in Janet Cook's case, it was many years ago, uh, so some of the pressures you're describing didn't exist then, although different ones did. Yeah, I think that there are some people who feel like uh, they are under such pressure to succeed that they need they can only be successful by lying. Um, uh, as I say, that's no excuse uh, for it. Um, and I will, uh, again, when we talk about sort of business or, you know, corporate responsibility and corporate ethics and all of this, I, I th I'll come back to this point. Um, uh, because I think uh, there are a couple of phenomena at work, phenomena at work. Uh, one is people feeling like they need to, that their, you know, their jobs are in jeopardy in a way that I think that was not so prevalent uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and the other is that the, the, Mechanisms for evaluating work uh, are difficult in journalism. It's hard to, it's hard to say in a, in a kind of statistical way who your good people are and who your less good people are. Um, it's hard to, to say what differentiates a great story from a good one. Those, some of this is matters of taste. Um, one consequence of that, uh, that com combined with sort of lug-headed uh, leadership of news organizations has been to emphasize production that people are, are graded on their story count, the number of pieces they've done. Um, that encourages people to write too quickly, uh, I think. I think um, it's, it's a consequence of having people who are doing the evaluating who are not very good, so they rely on something that they can measure easily. Uh, another one I'll tell you that I think is really negative, and again, I'll talk about this more later in the course, but people are sometimes evaluated uh, based on how many corrections they've had, and it's considered uh, a demerit to have had a lot of corrections. Well, obviously, the, you don't want reporters to refuse to correct material. They have a responsibility to correct material. So in some ways, this downsizing and the pressures that you describe have created precisely the disincentive for the behavior you want, which is you want reporters, when they realize they've made a mistake, to quickly come forward, to correct it forthrightly, and to get on. If you're going to, at the end of the year, say, well, you've had 17 corrections, you're fired, well, you've obviously not encouraged them to behave the way you want them to. So I do think the environment of journalism uh, has made some of these things worse. Um, yes? Um, going off of what you said, in, um, in the book they actually said that one of the reasons that there are errors is like the ignorant reporter, um, that because of cutbacks, um, journalists are being like assigned to more broad and general things. And so um, it said that a lot of editors think that just edu like journalism education needs to be repaired. Um, so that they know as much as their readers do. So do you, do you see that? Yeah, I, I don't know if this is the responsibility of journalism education or of news organizations. Um, uh, yeah, I would say the majority of people that I work with, for instance, do not have a formal education in journalism. They tend to come out of you know, other disciplines. But, but yeah, whether, it, whether it's done in the educational process um, 
or in the sort of you know early months and weeks that you work in a newspaper, someone needs to be sure that you're writing that you have sufficient expertise to write about what you're writing about. A lot of errors in journalism, for instance, are made in statistics and in numbers. Um, a lot of journalists are not terribly good at that. I'm not terribly good at it, um, but I know enough to ask people. Um, I mean. The other thing, the, the solution to a lot of errors is the willingness to ask the question that makes yourself look stupid. Um, and you know, sometimes journalists are embarrassed to do that. They don't want to admit to a source that they can't figure out that if something goes from, you know, from 10 to 22, that they can't figure out what the percentage increase of that is. Um, so rather than ask, they try to do it themselves and they get wrong. Um, you know, I mean, one, it's, you know, it's sort of an axiom of old journalism that you should always, you should never be afraid to ask a question that feels like a stupid question. Uh, because if you don't know the answer, it's better to make yourself look stupid asking the question than in print. Um, uh, but yes, I think, again, um, your observation about the level of expertise goes back to what I was trying to say earlier, which is that I do think newsrooms were full of older and more experienced people a while back, and those people tended to know stuff. I mean, my old, a friend and colleague, Henry Weinstein, um, covered legal affairs, uh, you know, since God was a boy uh, for the LA Times. He, uh, you know, um, uh, and he knew everyone in the legal culture uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, so if you had a question about a, a legal issue, Henry could get you the answer in 10 minutes. Um, you know, we have good people working at the paper today. I don't mean to knock anyone down, um, but we don't have the ability to do that the way we once did, and that's a problem. Um, and it means that people, good, hardworking, well-intentioned people, will get more things wrong if they know less. Um, and you know that is a consequence of having a younger and less experienced newsroom. <coughs> yes. Is there a difference between the ethics and corrections with like broadcast journalism? Mm. It's a great question. <clears throat> um, you know what? I wish I understood what ethics governed broadcast journalism on corrections because they run so few corrections. It's inconceivable to me that they make that few errors. Um, now, it's true that uh, there's less information uh, in a broadcast piece, you know, in a, uh, the night we know. There's one, someone did a study years ago um, that showed that if you, if you put the, you know, the evening news, half hour evening news, one of the network news shows, into typeface and, and just set it into columns, that it took up about two thirds of a page of the New York Times. Um, now, that, that means that the New York Times has a lot more in it uh, than the evening news. So maybe they make fewer errors just because they do less, so they report less. And also, you know, the camera itself is, you know, they say the camera really doesn't lie. So if you take a camera to a hearing and you broadcast a clip from the hearing, you can't really misquote anyone off the tape. The tape is what it is. So there may be certain mechanical reasons why broadcast journalism may be less susceptible to certain kind of errors. Uh, but I got to believe that they make more errors than they correct. And I don't know what ethic allows you to make an error and not correct it. <clears throat> yes, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, I interned at a news station this past oh, yeah. summer, and it was funny to see how many errors there were, like people calling in, and mm -hmm. the news directors would just like sometimes blow things under the rug, like, oh, we don't need to like, research that. You're, you're affirming my worst fear uh, with respect to those. Yeah, I mean, I. You know, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. It does seem to me, though, that, that broadcast stations have the same obligations to fix things as, as, as print organizations. And whether they do that on the web or at some point in the newscast or whether they reserve, you know, 15 minutes every Sunday morning to run all their corrections, I don't know. But it doesn't feel like it's happening. And I don't think, I'm quite sure that your experience is not unique. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, to the back. Um, I was going to say exactly what you just said. Uh -huh. It's said that in the book as well. Uh -huh, I noticed that, yeah. Tend to report it, like they may talk about it in the newsroom amongst themselves, but they won't report it the next day, even though they clearly know they had made a mistake. I don't know exactly why they do that, but. I, yeah, I gotta say, I just think that that's uh, indefensible. I think if you know you've made a mistake, you have to make some effort to make it right. And that, that can't, there can't be an ethical distinction between broadcast and print in that regard. Um, it just means that some people are taking more seriously their ethical obligations than others, I would say. Yes? Well, I've been in a lot of like smaller newspapers that use a lot of Associated like, Press stories and stuff. Mm -hmm. So is that the responsibility of the Associated Press to fix a parent mistake, or is that the responsibility of every small newspaper? That's a good question. There is a legal answer to that and an ethics answer to that. Uh, the legal answer is that there is something called the wire service defense, um, so that if you run a wire service piece and you do so in good faith, you don't, you know, you don't introduce an error of your own, you run it as it was submitted to you, um, and somebody sues you for libel, you can, def you can defend yourself by saying, we, we had every right to rely on the accuracy of this feed that we got, of this piece. Um, the ethical answer, though, is I think if, if it appeared in your pages, you have to fix it, too. Um, 
And what you would typically do in a case like that, if, if we ran an AP story uh, you know, today that someone in Los Angeles alleged had an error in it, um, then uh, we would check it out. If it were wrong, we would fix it uh, on our, on where, with our other corrections, noting that it appeared in a wire story, and then alert the AP uh, to the fact that we've concluded that there was an error. And then they would, if they agree, they would run out a correction so that any newspaper that, or any organization that carried the piece could fix it the same way. Um, Someone else have a point? Um, all right, let me talk a little bit about a case that I alluded to recently that I was involved in, um, just to sort of illustrate uh, you know, how these things get resolved, how deception gets addressed uh, in a news organization context. Um, a co former colleague, <laughs> and that sort of gives away the ending uh, of mine, uh, by the name of Eric Slater, um, uh, uh, reported back in 2005 there was a uh, there was a, a student who died in a hazing incident up in Chico. Um, and uh, Eric went up, uh, was asked to, to write a, a feature about the effect on the community, um, Chico, Chico State being the university, um, and to write about the, the incident and its aftermath uh, up there. He filed the piece, uh, it was edited, it ran, um, I think it, as I said, I think it ran on March 29th of 2005. Um, quite quickly, uh, there was obvious there were a number of errors in it. Um, the, got the population of Chico wrong. He said the school was famous for its basketball team when it's famous for its baseball team. Uh, it said another student had died when that student had actually been hospitalized and hadn't died. He said he'd interviewed the university president when it turned out he actually got the quote from another paper. He didn't actually say that he introduced, uh, interviewed the president, but the story implied that we'd had an interview with the president when, in fact, the president had spoken to someone else and we'd uh, taken that quote. Um, there were, uh, so there was a, a long correction that f tried to fix these errors that ran. Um, I happened to be on leave from the paper at the time, but I had a conversation with the Metro editor um, after the correction ran, and she was concerned uh, that there was more to this uh, than met the eye, just because there were so many errors. Um, none of them were terrible, but they were cumulatively sort of made you wonder about the piece. There were then, once, you, once we looked at the piece, a few other sort of worrisome signs in the piece. There was a, a woman um, who was identified as someone who had posed in Playboy, but she was not named. Um, there was a man who said he had attended the funeral for this kid, but he had driven to the funeral, but hadn't wanted to go inside, and it was not sort of obvious why he would do that, um, especially when it turned out that the funeral was held several hours uh, from Chico. Um, so basically, to make a long story uh, short, uh, Janet, the editor, asked uh, me to go up to Chico and to interview some of the people who were in the piece and just report out to try to determine whether uh, the, whether these were just innocent errors, or for whatever reason, a bunch of them all clustered in one piece, or whether there was something worse uh, at work. So I went to Chico, I interviewed students and administrators there, I walked around the campus to try to see if the descriptions of the campus matched uh, the descriptions in the piece. Um, uh, Eric uh, co uh, cooperated uh, with all this, he gave me notes and rental car receipts and hotel bills and whatnot, um, so that we could try to determine, had he actually gone to Chico? and done the reporting and just made errors, or had he, was there some act of deception here? Um, uh, again, to make a long story uh, somewhat shorter, ultimately uh, I concluded um, that he had not, in fact, uh, been in Chico, at least when he said he was, um, and that there, were, there was evidence not just of mistakes, but of fabrication. Um, he then, I uh, uh, was, the way we set this up is that I then questioned him in front of the Metro editor and the managing editor um, so that he could answer uh, the questions that had come up in the course of my uh, inquiry. You know, for instance, he said he was in a bar and did an interview at such and such a time, but there was a hotel record that indicated he checked into a hotel at about that time, three or 400 miles away. And so there's a question trying to reconcile his account with what appeared to exist in the records. Um, he did not, to the satisfaction of the, I was not involved in the decision uh, as to what should happen to him. Uh, all my role was merely to determine whether the story was accurate or whether there was evidence of fabrication in it. Um, uh, again, to make a long story short, ultimately uh, he was, um, the editors, uh, the senior editors of the paper concluded that he had not told the truth. Um, he was given the opportunity to resign. He resigned, withdrew his resignation, and then was fired. Um, I don't know where he is uh, today. Um, but uh, it, uh, again, I mention this mainly uh, to try to, to impress on you that A, uh, fabrication and deception are, of course, taken extremely seriously. Um, um, and, you know, B, I guess in this case, because it's the one I know the best because I'm closest to it, uh, the, there is just a world of difference between making a mistake 
and lying uh, to a reader or to an editor. Um, that I don't know what would have happened um, if uh, Eric had come back at, out of this episode and said, I made a series of mistakes. Um, and I apologize. I want to fix it. Um, but when the question became whether, um, whether he could be trusted to tell the truth about what happened, and again, that was not my judgment to make, uh, that really, I think, made it inevitable that this would have the mo most grave uh, consequences for him professionally. Um, so um, I want to move from there to talk a little bit about how to correct errors. Um, uh, we, um, well, I've, I've already gotten into some of this already, so some of this will sound repetitive. But um, first of all, let me just say, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, the obligation to correct an error in a story is no less than the obligation to get material correct in the first place. So you're out there, you're trying to report, you're trying to get things right. Um, sometimes you make a mistake and you get something wrong, then your obligation is to make it right. And as, long, as I say, as long as you do that uh, you know, in good faith, you do it uh, you know, knowing that there, you're vulnerable to mistakes like anyone, then I think there's relatively little consequence. That will happen. You, shouldn't, you, know, you should be careful. Uh, you should not, try not to make mistakes. But when you make them, if you fix them quickly and you admit it promptly to readers, you can get on with things uh, quite easily. Um, as I said also uh, in response to a question, we try to display those corrections in a consistent place so that readers can find them. So that while they may not, the correction may not appear on precisely the same page as the original error, that they are easily found. We don't try to hide them. You know, we don't, when we make a mistake, we try to admit it. Yes. Is there like a specific column instead yes. of errors? Okay. It's called for the record, uh, and it's called for the record for a reason, which is it combines what we would think of as a correction, a factual error that needs to be fixed, as well as uh, sometimes there's a bit of clarification that's needed on a piece. Um, sometimes we'll run an editor's note. Um, and those won't necessarily be about factual errors, or there may be disputed facts in certain cases. So we use the term for the record as a kind of global term that includes corrections and notes of one kind or another to readers. But yes, it is a specific place, and it's identified as such, and hopefully easy to find. Um, the other process that by which we hear from readers a lot, in addition now these days to, um, to message boards and all kinds of, uh, of uh, web-based uh, interactivity, um, is letters to the editor. Um, uh, letters uh, run uh, on the same page as editorials. Um, they are handled by the editorial page's staff, um, specifically by our letters editor named Aaron Brown. Um, we get a uh, couple hundred letters a day, sometimes, sometimes four or five hundred, sometimes 150, 200, depending on the time of year and the issues. Um, we only run 12 or 13, 14 uh, a day, so obviously the vast majority of letters we get don't make it into the paper. Um, but the first thing that we do with letters uh, is we review them, actually Aaron uh, reviews them, to see if they make a claim of inaccuracy in a piece. Um, because we don't run, it is not a solution to a story that has an error in it to just run a letter say, pointing out that there is an error in it. If, we, if we've made a mistake in a story, it's our obligation to correct it using the process that I just described for you, a correction that runs either in our correction spot um, or in the case of the editorial pages, you know, on the page or, you know, in sometimes in the various sections where the error occurred. One of the reasons to do that is a web reason, which is that if, if you correct a piece, then the correction is attached to that piece in our archives. So that anyone who then goes to look up the piece, either a reader or a reporter, won't repeat the error. Um, that it'll be attached to the piece in such a way that you'll, you'll understand that the, the piece had a mistake in it. If we, run it. if we just ran it as a letter, if we had a story that said, uh, you know, um, the, it, it rained on Tuesday when it didn't rain, and we didn't correct it with it, we just had a letter over here, you would never be able to attach the two pieces. So the first thing that Erin does when she reviews letters is tries to call out of the pile any ones that allege that there is an error. It, those then go to another editor who examines them. And, you know, often people will allege an error that won't be an error. So the, the reader's rep is what her position is called, reviews those pieces, goes over them with, uh, with those allegations, goes over them with editors and reporters, and determines where corrections are warranted. There's a whole other pile of letters left, though, and those are ones that take issue with pieces. They either disagree with an editorial, they, you know, they think that the coverage of something was wrong, not factually wrong, but, but improper in some way. They don't like you know, either a news story or a movie review or a, you know, whatever. I mean, they've got some issue with the coverage. Uh, those are the pieces that we look for in letters. We try to run letters, uh, just so you know, um, roughly in proportion to what we receive. So if we get you know, 100 letters on 
uh, Obama's uh, health care plan, or you know, the Senate health care version, the Senate version of the health care plan, say, and 85 of those letters support the plan and 15 oppose it. We try to run more letters. You know, we can't run 100 letters, but we try to run more letters supporting the plan than opposing it. Um, you know, we give a slight nod. P people think that we choose letters because we agree with them. That's not true. Um, in fact, if anything, we try to give more voice to readers who write in to disagree uh, with the coverage than who agree with it on the theory that we've already presented the coverage, so the alternative point of view is expressed in the letter taking issue with it. We publish. Um, now, that sometimes we get many more letters that will agree with an editorial than disagree with it. Uh, in those cases, we'll run pieces that agree with uh, the editorial because they'll be representative. But we'll always try to make sure that there is some voice given to those who take issue uh, with the coverage. Um, we have you know, ex experimented with the idea of putting more letters online and doing things like that so that we could give more voice to readers. Um, but the point is we get a lot of letters. We run relatively few just because of space constraints. But we choose them carefully. And we don't uh, use the letter space to run corrections. That that's handled separately. Um, finally, uh, and we just have a few minutes left, I wanted to talk about one other uh, technique. And it's addressed in the, in the book uh, that some people have adopted for trying to prevent errors uh, for getting into the to news, or news coverage. Um, and that's the uh, notion that stories should be read back uh, to people. Um, this is a very hot topic uh, within the LA Times. Um, there are some reporters who do read stories back uh, to sources. Um, there are some who don't. Um, the ones who do tend to feel very strongly that it's uh, a good idea, and the ones who don't tend to feel very strongly that it isn't. Um, let me just note, there are, clear, there are clear reasons to do it and not to do it. Um, uh, I have happen to have a point of view on which is the right course, but, but before I get to that, let me just say, you know, obviously, it's an opportunity to check facts. Um, if you read a story back to uh, a knowledgeable source and you've made an innocent error, you might catch it. Uh, and that's a good reason to do it. Uh, it's a chance, uh, to, therefore, to, to correct sort of trivial errors, spellings, ages, uh, you know. I mean, things that in haste or for whatever reason you may have made a mistake with, a, a, a smart, you know, well-meaning source will help, may, may help you catch them. It's also a chance to check quotes. Uh, if you read quotes back to the people who gave them to you, sometimes you'll write something down wrong. Um, and it's a chance to fix it. Um, there are some reporters uh, who believe that it strengthens the legal, the ability to defend a story legally once it's published. Um, I'll say more on that in a minute. Um, but the theory there would be that you can't possibly be engaged in an act of malice toward a subject of a story if you are allowing that subject of the story to hear what you're going to write before you write it and give them a chance to fix it. Um, so that's the argument for it. But there are also uh, a bunch of arguments against it. Um, it places, for one, it places a great deal of control over the story in the hands of the person you're now reading it to. Um, so you know what happens, for instance, um, if you read back a quote to a source and the source says, I, I, I didn't say that, or I didn't mean to say that, or I don't want you to run that. Um, well, uh, now you're in a tough conversation with that person uh, because you've given them the opportunity to have an opinion about it. If you're confident that your notes are correct, the source may be asking you to change it because it's embarrassing. Or because on reflection, the source wishes he or she hadn't said it, but they did say it. Um, you know, so what do you do? if in the course of reading back a piece, the source says, I don't want that quote in the paper. Um, now, there are some people who would say, I'm reading it back to you for accuracy, but not for you to make a determination. But then the source can come back and say, well, it's inaccurate. You're sort of, it places you in a can place you in a difficult uh, situation. I would also argue that it elevates some sources over other sources. Because presumably, not everyone who's affected by the story is going to have it read back to them. Um, so those people who get it read back to them have a lot more ability to influence what the story looks like than those who either are unavailable or you don't call. Yes? Um, this might be slow, but do reporters take reporters or do people usually don't want it? Well, it depends. Uh, I've actually, over the years, um, had most sources that I have talked to be appreciative uh, of having a tape recorder there so that there's a record of it. One extremely conspicuous exception to that was when, after the conclusion of the Simpson case, when my colleague Henry Weinstein and I, who I mentioned earlier, uh, interviewed O.J. Simpson. He tried to take my tape recorder. Um, <coughs> I, I took it back. But it was, it was a nerve-wracking moment. Um, um, uh, I think most sources would allow it and even appreciate it, because it's a, it's a, it gives them a sense that they are going to be faithfully recorded. Now, a lot of interviewing happens over the phone. 
You can't wiretap. You can't take a phone call without the subject's permission. To, so there's a whole other set of laws and rules that apply there. Uh, and there are some sources that are made uncomfortable by either a, a, a audio recorder or, as in, is increasingly prevalent, a video device of some sort. So some people will ask you not to. Yeah. Do you have to state that you're recording the conversation? Uh, California law requires that if you are going to tape a phone conversation that both parties be aware. No, I mean, not the phone, but oh. you're just talking. It could be like wear a wire or something. Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know if an in-person conversation changes the recording rules. Uh, let me check that out, and I'll get you an answer next week. Um, I, in any event, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest doing things surreptitiously, uh, yeah. just because for the most part, that's going to create more of a problem than it's worth. Um, did anyone else have a question? Well. Um, anyway, I, uh, my point on the question of reading back on elevating some sources over others is that once the story appears, if the sources who weren't contacted for the story object to it, it does create an awkward thing to have to explain to people as to why you read it back to some people and not others. Uh, some people have more influence, presumably, than others doing that. Um, if finally, um, I guess, I w as for the legal argument, um, this question that somehow it reduces the paper's exposure or the news organization's exposure to a lawsuit because it's an act of good faith to read it. I would just point out that in the case of the Jewel uh, episode that we talked about on Tuesday, they did read that story back to a law enforcement source. So it didn't help. Um, and I guess, uh, to me anyway, and I recognize that there are good arguments on either side, to me, the arguments against reading the story back outweigh those uh, in favor of reading the story back. Um, I really do uh, think that it's... Uh, I, there are times where I have uh, shared a quote back with someone or where I, certainly it is acceptable to call people back and check facts. Um, but I think to actually read the piece invites a, uh, a situation that you don't want to get yourself into. To me, the nightmare situation in a readback would be to read a story back to someone who you know, doesn't like the story and says to you, no, it's not correct, and I'm not going to tell you why it's not correct. Good luck to you. Um, because then if you go ahead and publish, you've done it having been warned, which may strengthen the argument that you are, in fact, acting recklessly or with malice. Um, you haven't gotten yourself anything out of it. If it's a source who's hostile to your interest, they're not going to help you to make it right so that you can write a bulletproof story that gets them in trouble. Um, I just feel like it turns so much power over your ultimate story from yourself to a source or the subject of a story that you end up creating more ethical trouble than you solve. Um, but I, as I say, I recognize that other people come to different conclusions on that, so uh, I'm not trying to impose that view on anyone. I just think it's, uh, on balance, a bad practice. Um, with that, we're about out of time unless someone has a question or two. Um, no, good. If that's the case, then, I will see you Tuesday. Uh, remember, there's that little modified reading. Uh, I know I, there are a couple people who made appointments to come see me at 11.30 and 12. That's great. I'll be around for a little while after that today or back on Tuesday. So thank you all. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>